こんにちは。私はシャドウェイ。サバ。Welcome, folks. To another episode of Path to Kyoto. This episode is going to be slightly different in terms of format. Because I want to do a few episodes every now and then where we focus on a clan or, you know, like. One of the main clans, or one of the smaller clans that we come across. And these will be periodically dropped in. Like an episode, this will be episode three, and、uh, the next one might be episode 13 or 14 or whatever. Whenever I feel like I'm in the mood just to talk about the history. So the footage in the background is continuation of where we left off. And the next episode, I'll go into what was going on. But I, like I said, I want to sort of make this a sort of educational let's play as well as something interesting to watch. Now, we're actually going to focus on the clan we picked, which is the Minamoto clan. And I'll go into sort of how. The Minamoto clan came to be. And we may even talk about a bit of the military troops that we get to use in the game. Now, Minamoto was one of the first surnames to be, to be bestowed by emperors of Japan upon members of imperial family during the Heian period. Although the Heian period was not the only era that this was used, I completely went blank there. The last occurrence of emperors giving noble, nobility titles, surnames like this, was during the Senjuku era. The Taira were another offshoot of the imperial dynasty. And the Minamoto clan was also known as the Genji, using the Sino Japanese pronunciation of Chinese characters for Minamoto and family. Now, the Minamoto were one of four great clans that dominated Japanese politics during the Heian period. The other three were the Fujiwana, the Taira, and the Tachibana. Now, the Tachibana are not in this game. As a playable faction. Now, but what we're going to do is, I'm going to do an episode of their history some point in this act. Because they're a part of this period of Japan, so it, they need to be explained in some form. Now, the first emperor to grant the names, the surname Minamoto, was Emperor Saga. Who ruled Japan from the year 809 to the year 823? Now, Emperor Saga reportedly had 49 children, which resulted in a significant burden on the imperial financial system. Now, in order to alleviate some of that pressure of supporting his unusually large family, He made many of his sons and daughters nobles instead of royals, and chose the name Minamoto for their surname. Now, Minamoto actually means origin, and that signified that the new clan would have the same origins as the royal family. Afterwards, emperors such as Emperor Sawa, Emperor Murakami, Murakami, sorry. Emperor Uda and Emperor Daigo, amongst others, also gave their sons or daughters the name Minamoto. Now, these specific hereditary lines coming from different emperors developed into specific clans with the surname of Minamoto, referred to by the emperor's name followed by Genji, for example, Sewa Genji. Or Saga Genji. 
according to some sources, the first name given to be given, the first person to be given the name Minamoto was Minamoto no Makoto, the seventh son of Emperor Saga. Now, in 814, Emperor Saga awarded the Kabini, Kabini Minamoto no Asan to his non-heir sons. Thereafter, they and their descendants ceased to be members of the imperial family. Basically, what he did was give them the title. So it would actually become a legitimate clan. And several subsequent emperors gave the Minamoto surname to their non heir sons. Now, the most prominent of, of the several Minamoto families, the Sawa Jinji, defend, descended from Minamoto no Sunemoto in the year 917 to 961. The grandson of the 56th Emperor Sawa. Tsunemoto, extremely difficult to try and say that, went to the provinces and became the founder of a major warrior dynasty. Minamoto no Mitsukana formed an alliance with the Fujiwara, and thereafter the Fujiwara frequently called upon the Minamoto to restore order in the capital of Kyoto. Now, the Sawa Genji fortunes declined during the Hogan Rebellion. Hogan. Oh, we're not Hoganers. Hey, brother. What you gonna do? Sorry. Uh, when the Taira executed much of the Sawa Genji's bloodline. During the Heiji disturbance, the head of the Sawa Genji clan, Minamoto no Yoshimoto, died in battle. And Tirino Kiyomoyo Mori sorry, seized power in Kyoto by forming a forming alliance between the retired emperors Shirakawa and Toba and infiltrating the Kuns. He sent Minamoto no Yorimoto, the third son of Minamoto no Yoshimoto of the Sawa Genji into exile. In 1180, Yorimoto mounted a full-scale rebellion against the Taira rule, which led to basically what we are now in uh, Shogun, which is the Genpei War, otherwise known as the Taira Minamoto War. Now, I won't go into the rest of it because it sort of explains the rest, but we're going to go into that further down the line. Now, there were 21 branches of the clan, and I'm going to try and say some of them, but please, apologies for if I get anything wrong. Now, uh, there was the Saga Genji, which had quite a few. It had more than 10. More than ten like, heads. And clans such as the Watanabe, Matsura, and Kamachi descended from the Saga Genji. Now there were clans such as the Nimoyo Genji, the Monotuku Genji, the Sewa Genji, uh, Uda De Genji. Daigo Genji, uh, Murakami Genji, uh, Kazan Genji, and so forth. So it proved to be quite a large combination of clans within the Minamoto family. So that's more or less a bit of history regarding the clan we, we have sided with. Now, 
more or less onto the game here. I was uh, been struggling throughout this entire recording to sort of get a strong enough force to take on the Chiba clan. And as you'll see, we actually start to go into it. I'm like, yes, we can do this here. So I was very happy, and obviously we're going to go into the battle, which we'll talk about certain things, and troops, and what their abilities were. ものども あの The force for this battle actually consists mostly of Naganata levies and three squads of ball levies. So we're going to sort of have a look into the stats on those two unit types. Now, a Naganata levy, its strength is good against infantry and cavalry. Uh, and it's a large unit size. The their weaknesses are being basically they're weaker, much more squishy, and they have a low morale. But they do have a bonus against cavalry due to the weapon they wield. They have one ability that more or less is shown in a defensive battle, which is a shield, like a screen type shield. And it impedes the movement of enemies and blocks projectiles. So it's very good for putting your putting them up and having, say, your archers move behind these screens. Now a naganata is a long staff with a curved sword-like blade on one end, and it does actually require a lot of skill to use proficiently, and has much in common with a spear and a sword both. It can stab like a spear, or cut like a sword, as circumstances require. In skilled hands, for example, it has the reach to decapitate a horseman. Now that's why Naganata levies and the higher tier units were used a lot. Because of their weapons diversity. However... Despite their weaponry and the numerical strength, Naganata levies are still vulnerable to missile attacks and should not be expected to defeat the very best quality enemies. Historically, the Naganata was a weapon much savored for self-defense by samurai ladies when their men were at war. The pole arm's length con con compensated. I hate that word for the difference in height and reach between a man and a woman. It was not though a woman's weapon. The Shohei monks used it with some skill and samurai sometimes favoured it for mounted combat. A competent horseman could stand in the, st in the syrups, uh, whirling the Naganata and striking enemies left and right. That's what basically what a levy is. You know, it's the very basic skilled Naganato wielders. Now on to Bo Samurai not Bo Samurai uh, Bo Infantry 
open up all levies. Very basic. Actually, I am wrong. Yes, I'm right. Sorry, it is I am right. I keep getting confused on the icon. Now, their strengths and weaknesses are as follows. Their weaknesses are low accuracy and reload rate, low morale, and are vulnerable, vulnerable to cavalry and weak against higher quality troops. Basically, bow levies and nagonata levies are more favoured for a defensive scenario where enemies are coming in to attack like your castle town their only strength is the large unit supply now their abilities are flaming arrows which self-explanatory really and screens which are the same now levies do not possess the powers or the prestige of samurai but they are still a formidable formidable force the numerical size of this unit type allows it to provide mass fire support once hand to hand combat starts bow levies should retreat safely behind the battle line as they are not trained for this type of battle they must also be wary of cavalry and have little chance of survival. Japanese bows at the time of the Genbei War can generally be classified as long bows, although they differ in a number of ways from their European counterparts. The most obvious difference was the position of the grip, but they were also composites made from several different materials rather than the self bows made from a single piece of wood. The bows had to be long enough to generate power, but if the grip had been central it would have been impossible for use on horseback. The lower section would always become entangled with a horse or the saddle. By moving the grip downwards the asymmetrical design allowed the bows to be easily used by mounted archers while keeping them enormously powerful. That's basically it for the force. I know we've actually gone past the battle, which is a bit insane, but more or less what happened after this was I opened up a few agreement, trade agreements. I tried to uh, request allegiance of a neighboring faction, kept failing miserably and more or less turning my sights now onward to Kyoto because we're really getting cut, uh, turtled in by our other Minamoto family. Now I have been Shadowbane and I really do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please leave a like, uh, leave a comment, tell me if you enjoyed this sort of historical episode or not uh, please do give feedback because it does help immensely it means i produce better quality videos for you guys which is what i want to do and i will see you next time sign up